Welcome to the talk on the code review blueprint, or formerly known as Better Code Reviews. So this talk is being given by myself, at least I think so. Um, I'm David, an engineering manager over on the Create Editor stage, and we have Yannick. Yeah, hello everybody, and thanks for making us to this workshop. My name is Yannick. I'm a front-end engineer on the security team at GitHub. So we're excited to talk about some code reviews. So look, you know, a lot of people, they've already been through the chops on code reviews. So you might be asking yourself, what have I got to learn here, really? You know, so we're going to tell you what we hope you'll come away with at the end of this talk. Absolutely. That is probably a question that is going through a lot of minds at this workshop at this moment. But here's what we have for you. If you're already a code review wizard, you're going to learn about technical empathy, about how to read a room, and how to collaborate like a pro. If this topic is rather new to you and you're a new kid on the block, we'll make it better when it comes to the most efficient code review patterns, how to communicate with authors, and how to use GitLab interface. I don't know about anything else, but I am sold. So one forward that we want to mention, something we pulled out of our code review values, much like the way we have our credit values, is when we think about code reviewing, the thing at the forefront of everybody's mind should always be merge profitability. What is merge profitability? It is essentially a percentage representation of whether or not the merge you are looking at is going to add value to the code base. And that value can either be for developers or it can be for users. But essentially, we're always aiming for a higher percentage of merge profitability. And that's what the code review process should really drive. We've left a link in this slide to the reviewer values if you want to read more about this asynchronously. But this is the core keystone to keep in mind when reviewing code. Great stuff. Let me take a second and tell you how are we going to do that. We'll be having all the details about what makes a code review good or bad. We actually prepared a real world example on GitLab to the folks, and we're happy to answer all your questions on the topic in, your, in our Q&A after the session or async with, um, in the issue which you're going to find in the chat. So before we jump straight into being an awesome reviewer, we're going to talk a little bit about being an awesome author. You know, because if you're going to review code, you got to write some code. Or if you're going to review changes, you got to write some changes. So what are some things we can do to be good authors? Well, the first thing you could do is whenever you're offering a merge request, you can put yourself in the reviewer's seat ahead of time. And you can self-review your changes in the exact same way you would review any other merge. This is an invaluable asset, and it can really, really help save time and reduce feedback cycles in your code review process. If you know something is complex, if you know it needs extra context, maybe you just didn't quite get to that last thing and you know you're going to be asked for a follow-up, just go ahead and create it. Acknowledge it. Your reviewer will thank you and you'll save time. And the next thing is to look at always showing empathy in your communication. Make sure that you are empathetic in the way that you approach your communication with your reviewer. They've taken the time to invest and sit down and review your changes. And so make sure that your communication comes from an empathetic place. Absolutely. Great stuff. Before you hand the MR over, please read your own description and send it. check it. You want to focus all the concentration your reviewer has on the important things. Make it easy for them to understand the problem you're trying to solve. This also comes along with providing all the information and values in a digestible way. Your reviewers will surely appreciate that. Do we have anything else to consider, Dave? So the last thing to consider is a pattern we would like to encourage within your code reviews. So in GitLab, we're not opposed to squashing commits and rewriting history. If it needs to be done, it needs to be done. But a valuable pattern to get into the habit of if you're using Git is to commit small and commit often, and to use that looking small commits to build out a linear change history and emerge. This gives the code reviewer a, a set of contextual steps, commit by commit, they can step through to really gain context for how your merge came to be and what they should really look at in a review. And then the reviewer can always squash the commits at the end into a presentable commit adhering to our standards. But this is a really, really fantastic tool to get in the habit of, especially if you're dealing with very large contextual merges and changes. Absolutely. Yeah, so let's switch sizes uh, and speak about some best practices when you're actually reviewing a merge request from somebody at GitLab or someone from our community. Assume positive intent. Nobody will assign you a not perfect MR just to annoy you. There might be reasons for it that you don't know about, so lean back, be relaxed, and dive into the review. Provide feedback in a timely manner. If a merge request is out of your comfort zone, or you currently don't have any time to review it, 
feels zero shame in saying that and assigning it to another person. If you're doing the review, please make sure to provide some feedback within two days. When it comes to giving feedback, please be sure to be as precise as possible. Don't let the alpha assume what you might have meant to say clearly. The most important thing to me, don't let each other fail. If you as a reviewer notice that the author is having a hard time solving the problem, help them out, try to point them in the right direction. All of these four bullet points are sub values from a collaboration value here at GitLab. Since everything starts with a merge request around here, we couldn't have said there was any better. Fantastic. I think that last point is my favorite, especially when we're keeping merge profitability in mind. We're here to help each other, not tear each other down. So what else can we do when we're reviewing a merge? Well, we can actually make sure we understand the intention of the MR. And this is something that can be done through looking at associated issues, associated ethics, maybe even getting in touch with a product manager who is driving the feature that spawned the MR. We need to really understand what the intention of the MR, what the problem is being solved to really be able to justify a good review. So if you are not sure, if you find yourself lacking context or what the MR is trying to solve, if it's gray in any way, feel free to reach out to people. Feel free to ask, look through associated issues, gaining context and understanding the problem that's being solved is key. So another thing to ask yourself is, is the author of this merge request working in their field of expertise? In GitLab, we believe working across stages, working across technologies, working across problems. And often we have authors who are working outside of their level of comfort. You might be a front-end developer and you've decided you want to try a bit of full stack and you've offered up some Rails and or spec. It could be your first time. And so as a code reviewer, it's always good to keep an awareness of where the author is and their technical proficiency when they're offering a change. And if you find that they're not quite where they should be, Work with them. Look at it as an opportunity for upskilling and for some serious collaboration. Last, does the author need additional explanation of the problems at hand? This, thankfully, does not happen too much. But as a good code reviewer, it's something to watch out for. And this is something that specifically targets maintainers. You do need to make sure that the author was solving the problem that the issue or epic actually described. So you need to make sure that they're in alignment with what their PM or what UX is driving from the change. If it looks like it might be in some way out of sync, feel free to reach out to the PM or UX directly on the merge. This creates good collaboration, open transparency. And we encourage that everyone is aiming for the right goal, which is to create lovable features for our users. Absolutely. But there are even more things to consider. Giving praise is free of charge. So if you see something you like, just say it. Be careful with phrases just for the sake of praising them. Encourage errors and analyze them. Make the MR of psychological safe place. A merge request is a place of human interaction and humans tend to make mistakes. If that wasn't the case, we could skip our review process completely. Celebrate errors that are found. Because it's a great thing when a bug was catched before it even hit our main branch. Another thing to keep in mind is to define goals and make clear what's needed for approval. This is crucial, especially on larger merge requests. As an author, it's sometimes tricky to find out what is good advice from a reviewer or an actual issue. So provide additional information about whether your comment is blocking or not. Fantastic. And encouraging a psychological safe space in merge requests is really, really fundamental in GitLab. We work especially with maybe even unconscious biases, such as authority bias, if we're looking to a maintainer as an example. And so having people out in front leading, creating psychological safe spaces to fail, to make mistakes and experiments is a really important part of the process. So last but not least, some of these are so important, we've had to repeat them. So review fully every time you sit down to review. Don't let merges or code reviews develop a long tail. This is a poor habit to get into. If for some reason you are not able to dedicate your entire context and your entire attention to reviewing in one, in one swing, it's OK to hand off. It's OK to raise your hand and say, I'm busy. Maybe I've got other things going on. Maybe there's something happening in your real life. Maybe I'm being pulled away from work. Fine. Raise it. Let the author know. Give them a rough time estimate of when you can get back and when you can legitimately contextually sink in. And if that's not acceptable, let the author know they can always hand off to somebody else. This feeds into the next point, which is if for some reason you find your context or concentration being broken by lack of understanding or awareness, feel free to ping people. Loop people in often, loop people in early. 
We don't believe in bothering people. We have short toes here at GitLab as a value. So we ideally you get experts in as soon as possible if there's something you don't understand and you want to continue the merge train rolling. Next, be precise in your language. Um, this is a sin that a lot of people suffer from when they're reviewing code. We need to be very deliberate and very nitty gritty in our language. Take the time to genuinely explain what might be the issue, what might be the problem, what you're looking for from the author. Authors are not mind readers, and we need to make sure that we express ourselves succinctly in our language. Last, recommendation, which is going to be the basis of how we demonstrate the code review in the live example, is use the conventional common system developed by our very own Paul Slaughter. The conventional common system is a wonderful contextual common system designed to inject your comments on a merge request for a review with stateful context that an author can parse. It also makes them grepable for later on if you need to pull them up for some reason. So we'll touch on this a bit now in a second. Awesome, yeah. So let's go full circle and speak about best practices when you're receiving feedback as an author. Be fearless about making mistakes. We link to your great example here, and we will share our sites um, within all the shared contribute stacks later on. Um, go check it out, it's great. Be free Keep in mind that assuming positive intent is a two way street. It also applies when you're seeing feedback. You lose the ego. If ideas and your changes are being questioned, try to stay open minded and as objective as possible. A code review is all about finding the best solution for a problem and nothing more than that. Last but not least, be proactive with collaboration. If there are any blockers coming up in your review, make sure that you ping people that can help out or open up follow up issue, issues ahead of time. And that is such an important point about losing the ego. We practice no ego at GitLab for a reason. The end goal of every merge is increased merge profitability, and that comes from working together. Individuals don't ever really build things, it's teams. And to work cohesively as a team, you have to feel safe to fail and to make mistakes. And that's the attitude we want to encourage across our company. So, a handful of code review sins before we move into the actual live demo. And these are things that if you find yourself in the habit of doing in your code reviews, stop, take some time, and figure out how you can stop doing these on a, you know, a regular basis if possible. The first thing would be poorly written or even worse, no comments. And to be honest, they're just as bad as one another. Poorly written comments, it speaks for itself. Um, for maybe whatever reason, you haven't had the time to express yourself, you use ambiguous language, you don't lean into collaboration, look to suggest solutions or look to work with the author to find a better way of offering up some code. Not a good way to review code. You're not going to feel good about it as a code reviewer, and the author's not going to feel good reading it. Next, no comments. And this is something that we need to be very cautious of. If for some reason you find yourself reaching for the hit approve button without having left any comments, really take a moment and stop and think, is that actually what's supposed to happen? As a rule of thumb, as soon as a merge request is over 10 lines, if you're hitting approve regularly with no comments, either the person you're reviewing is an absolute 10x, 100x, 1000x developer, or there might be something wrong in your review methodology. So make sure you question yourself before you hit approve if you don't have anything to say. It's not that we always have to have things to say, but we need to make sure that it's not a habit. Nitpicks. Nitpicks are a double-edged source, and they can be both good and bad, so we need to be careful if we're using them in code reviews. Nitpicks, where they can be useful is if you are suggesting something that might be succinctly beneficial to the code itself. So you're actually going to increase merge profitability by offering this. But if that is the case, we would actually encourage you to use something else, maybe like a suggestion, which we'll demonstrate later from the conventional comments syntax. Nitpicks have this terrible habit of becoming high cognitive load, and they generally don't actually increase merge profitability. So if you find yourself leaving nitpicks because it's your personal style, maybe consider leaving none at all. Next, not locally tested or not testing locally. So this does come with a caveat. If it's a one-line change to some copy, you're probably OK to skip the local testing. However, as soon as a merge requires some sufficient complexity, you're really not going to be able to understand the full scope of the changes without actually testing it. And we have different names for this in GitLab, but keep in mind during our code review process, some 
person in the chain eventually should review the code locally. It could be the initial reviewer, it could be the maintainer, it could be UX, it doesn't necessarily matter who, but somebody should look at this locally to make sure we haven't introduced edge cases. As, as human beings, we're not good at spotting things like that just by reading lines of code. Radio silence, and this might be the biggest sin on this list. We get it, you're busy, everybody is. You work at a busy company, things change, things are always moving. If you're being pinged and you're being asked for reviews and you know you're not going to quite get there, instead of leaving them on radio silence, consider going into the merge and leaving a comment with the author to express, hey, look, I see you pinged me, I'm busy, I might get to this in the next day or two. If that's okay, you can leave me assigned. If not, feel free to assign it to a different reviewer. But also consider, feel free to reassign it yourself if you're just not going to get there. It's much better to do that to respect the author's time than it is to let the merge sit. Because for the longer the merge sits, the quicker the code rots, the more context is lost. So if there's one thing you can avoid out of this list, please avoid radio silence. Last, not understanding the code you're reviewing. This is a problem. If you find yourself reviewing code that you don't understand contextually, reach out to domain experts. And the domain expert in this case could be the author, it could be somebody who is an expert in the technology, maybe you need a GraphQL expert, maybe you need a Rails expert, it doesn't necessarily matter. Just if you find yourself dealing with things you don't understand and you can't dedicate the time to, avoid the urge to hit approve just because it's easier. Look to reach out to people for help. We work at a company, this is why there's lots of developers, get some help. That's okay, lean into collaboration, work with the author. <laughs> so moving on from our code review sins, we're gonna actually go through a live demo of what we hope makes a good code review and give you some skills to take into your next set of code reviews. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give a slight example and then we're gonna jump over to a real world example with Yannick. Yannick has given me a pretty kick-ass code review. And so when I hand off to Yannick, feel free to just click on his screen to magnify it. So first, context. Context is king. And generally, when we talk about comments, we have two forms of context. We have blocking, which is meh. We're going to have to address this before we can before we can merge this code. The second type of thing is non-blocking. The second type of context is non-blocking, which is this is worth noting, but it's not necessarily a showstopper. We can actually move ahead, but maybe this warrants a conversation. So our first thing to talk about is merge meta. And merge meta, it doesn't get enough attention, but it's really important for good reviews. So as a good author and as a good reviewer, you should always be practicing good merge meta. This means good titles, good descriptions, good demos. As a reviewer, if you arrive in and you're not able to understand contextually what the change is supposed to do or what the merge is going to do from the description title and description or from the title description and images, you're going to probably struggle unless they've written an amazing test suite, which the odds of those two things happening in conjunction are not super likely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand off to Yannick, who's going to go ahead and show you what a good, good merge meta looks like. Absolutely. So let's jump right in into the MR that they brought into review. Let's go for his initial description at first. It says, tiny MVC for an issue where we migrate merge frame when docs pass from being generated on the back end to the front end to avoid drop tuning and redundant code. I don't know about you, but for me, reading this, I don't really know what's going on. So in my review, that was actually my first point. I mentioned as a non-blocking suggestion that this description was a little hard to get my head around. I helped him out. I provided a screenshot that is, yeah, to update his description, to make it easier for a maintainer or everybody else checking on this to actually see what's going on. I provided a list on how to reproduce the behavior on a local machine and even a little Git patch to make it easier for everybody involved to figure out what's going on. Stuff. It was definitely a lot nicer than my first attempt anyway. So next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about issues. And keep in mind, all of these have come from the conventional comments system. So in the slides itself, we've left a link to the conventional comments API doc. So we encourage you to have a read through. But the meat and potatoes of the conventional comments system uh, is made up of two parts. And the first one is issues. So issues are 
highlighting specific problems. Often they are blocking. If you find yourself reaching for an issue, this is more than likely a showstopper for this merge. And what we want to do is we want to get in the habit of writing good contextual issues that really laser-like focus in on what the problem is using precise language. What we don't want is we don't want ambiguous language. We don't want to just leave a comment on an arbitrary line of code that says, hey, this doesn't work. What we want to do is we want to say, this is a problem. This is why. And then we want to look to collaboratively find a solution for it. So Yannick, thankfully, has found a blocking issue, and he has found a way to work with me collaboratively for it. So I'm going to hand off to him now. Sweet, thanks. Yeah, there was one issue I actually found in UML. And you can see all of this in the demo video I provided. And that is one of those takeaways or a good example I'd, I'd like to recommend to everybody. Just pop up one of those videos. They are super fast to create and really make a difference when it comes to understanding the issue that you're actually speaking of. So please feel free after this talk, just give this a spin. And yeah, let's use this as an example. Other than that, I described the issue in a short text and try to make my best helping out fixing it by providing a suggestion to just apply. It was locally tested, and when you use, use one of those suggestions, please make sure that you do the same. So I particularly found the demo video here very helpful. So as an author, the first thing I did was I watched the video and I saw the problem that this was causing, uh, that this was being caused locally. And that was great, because that provided all the context for where Yana could highlight it. Uh, so next, we're going to move into questions. And generally, you're not going to see too many questions inside merges, but we would highly encourage you to use them very often. This is for breaking context silos. So if you find yourself unsure of something, that you are highlighting what could possibly be a potential problem, but you're just not quite sure, use a question. And when we use questions again, we want to use good, precise language with our questions. We want to really laser like focus in on what the problem we think is or whether or not it is a non-issue or a non-blocker. And so to give a good example of a question, I'm going to give over to Yannick, because Yannick had a blocking question, which is even more interesting. Absolutely. Um, so I did. And I can't even stretch this enough, David. We are uh, speaking of an incredible complex code base here at GitLab. And yeah, just very, very hard problems to solve. And reviewers as well, they will not know everything. So with this question, and that's why I'm blocking, I was just not quite sure what's going on here. And I've been yeah, looking into um, a thing that was removed, and I've seen the potential of them that this might not be removed fully. So that's why I asked. And I put this blocking beam like, I see some issues coming up with this. We don't want to deal with this later. So yeah, it's not an issue. It was just I, as a reviewer, was unsure about and asked for some help to the author. And that puts me as the author in a good position. So you've approached me with empathy, with kindness. You're just highlighting something you're not sure about. And maybe it's something I, I myself, as an author, didn't think of and just missed. And that can happen. We're just humans. So. The second part of the meat of potatoes of the conventional comment system is a tool called suggestions. And so suggestions are where you're going to work collaboratively with the author to propose changes inside the merge. And we have two ways generally of proposing changes. And our first is using our native GitLab UI tool, the suggestion tool, which is a really awesome tool. And I quite like it. I think it's fantastic for small, succinct changes. But the trick with using the suggestion tool is just that. As Yannick had mentioned previously, if you're going to offer changes using the suggestion tool, make sure that you have tested these changes before you offer them to the user. Make sure that you're not offering changes across complex pieces of code. It's good for one to three lines. Anything more, you might want to consider a patch file. Make sure that your formatting is correct. If you're going to offer a suggestion, it's a great thing. It's a collaborative thing. But make sure you do the author the service of getting it right yourself. So I'm going to hand over to Yannick for what makes a good suggestion. And remember, suggestions can also be non-blocking. Suggestions don't always incur a block in comment. Absolutely. Yeah. On Dave's merge request, there was actually a good example for a non-blocking suggestion. So he's been working on some specs. And those are actually running fine, and there was nothing really wrong about this. I just found 
a little thing to do better and to help us maintain this easier in the future. So therefore, this is absolutely non-blocking. Dave's first version is working as expected and is testing all the right thing. But there's just, if you're considering taking this up or not, then maybe consider accepting the suggestion. And something specifically I want to highlight in this suggestion here, which I think is fantastic tactical empathy, is Yannick thanking me for the test before we begin. So Yannick has acknowledged my efforts. He's acknowledged that I have tried to make the code base better, and he wants to work with me collaboratively. It's not just a shoot down of, hey, I think you can do this better. We're really encouraging that collaborative back and forth. So that's a great example of tactical empathy mixed with making a viable change to the code base. The next way of making suggestions, uh, if this is specifically targeted for complex suggestions that maybe span a couple of lines or a couple of files, and that's a patch file specifically. So a patch file is a generated file that's going to come from a diff that you will create locally, and then you can attach that inside your merge request for the author to review, and if they're happy with it, they can apply it. So why use a patch file over pushing directly to somebody's branch? Not that there's anything wrong with pushing directly to somebody's branch, but what patch files do is they really lean into the collaborative spirit of, hey, I've tested your code, I've looked at it, I think this can be done slightly better. I'm going to give you this patch file that I wrote, and you're going to let me know, and we can go back and forth on it. And it really invites the collaborative spirit. And they're a really fantastic thing to see being used more and more by code reviewers as standard. Yannick is going to show you an example of a great git patch for my merge. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going back to my very first comment, um, which, which was actually talking about the merge request meta information on this. So I applied a git patch to make it easier for reviewers or everybody involved to reproduce the behavior on the local machine. So git patches are such a great tool. They can be used on any kind of issue or comment you're actually going to make on a, on a merge request. So I highly recommend applying those if needed to your merge request description as well, just to make it sure we're all on the same page and we're working on the same purpose. So go ahead and patch all the things. Patch everything. It's fantastic. And again, you can see that Yannick has explained thoroughly why he's arrived at a Git patch. He's been very precise in his language for the problem it's attempting to solve. And that opens me, the author, up to good collaboration with him. And last but not least, my favorite part of the conventional common system is praise. Praise is a unique thing to the conventional common system that is something I hope to see really widely used across the GitLab code base because it, it really helps foster a fantastic environment for reviewing code. But praise is where you're going to highlight something positive. And the trick with praise is to really make sure that what you're praising is actually praiseworthy. You're not making something up. That can actually be detrimental to the author. As an example, something I genuinely love when I see in reviews is if somebody writes their test specs to succinctly describe what the feature is doing. So essentially, I can start by reading the tests and know exactly what this feature is going to do. That is something I love to see. It's something I encourage. And so every time I see it, that's a big old praise from me. Yannick is going to show you an example of what an actual praise looks like in a merge using Giphy and everything. Absolutely. Yeah, I found something to be praiseworthy in your mind. And um, it was it had to do with tests though. So um, after writing some tests or reading some tests rather, I'll mock that event out of date. And this is something which is easily forgotten. I'm just gonna we're gonna be left with a huge of cluttered mock data that nobody really knows about what's actually going on. So it's important to keep those things yeah clean. So um, that is absolutely great for me. Um, I added a gift in there just to make it a little bit fun and show some appreciation on this because that's good stuff over there. Absolutely. Uh, two pieces of advice I'll give you if you're using praise. The first piece of advice is to start your review with praise. Find the good thing first and go from there. Too often as humans, we tend to skew towards the negative and it can be very tempting as a reviewer to jump straight to problems in code. Try and humanize the problem by looking at the good things first. And then second, as Yannick did, involve a GIF. Everybody loves a GIF. It's a humanizing thing, and it looks fantastic on merges, and it creates a fun, safe environment to you know, make mistakes. It's not all super serious all the time. So 
that takes us everybody to the end of our presentation on better code reviews or the code review blueprint or whatever you would like to call it. We don't really mind. Does anybody have any questions? We'll jump over to the Q&A panel to see if anybody has any questions. If anybody wants to join us, feel free. So, Yannick, what did you use to create the demo video? Um, I'm actually using a software called OBS, which is open source and free to download. It is it is able to do a lot, so it might be a little bit intimidating, but it's not so hard to get your head through. I definitely know there are plenty of other options. Uh, QuickTime Player can do the same. I know about some people actually using like recorded Zoom sessions with themselves. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of options, whatever works for you. Um, I go by OBS, which I, I'm going to uh, put a link in the chat pretty quickly. And yeah, one more thing, actually that I tend to do um, if you are working with longer demo videos, because uh, of Notrecas, GitLab has a maximum upload um, limit from 10 megabit, which can be quite annoying. What I tend to do is then still upload it in a resolution, whatever does make sense, and then just privately send whoever um, is needed a better version for it so they can comfortably, comfortably do it. That's a fantastic tip. I personally, I tend to just use QuickTime and then trim the video down as needed and reduce the quality if uh, if it's too big. But I do like the OBS quite a bit. It's quite useful technology. And as Annabelle mentioned, we won't be paying for Loom licenses in the future. So I would highly recommend swapping over. <laughs> Sweet. What else do we have? Do we have any other questions? No, but Kai has mentioned we're making the conventional common system native. We're thinking about it. Ooh, I will be jumping on that ethic, my friends. <laughs> that sounds absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really fantastic system. It's 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 the fact that you can inject context into every single comment. So as an author, the biggest problem with code reviews is that as an author, if you submit a piece of code and you go to bed and you wake up and all of a sudden you see an email or a notification and you have 20 comments to work through. That can actually be very demoralizing over time. And since this is our bread and butter, we do this a lot, it can take a really big toll on author. So breaking that into genuine context, so as an author, I know exactly, all right, I'm just being asked a question. Okay, there's only really out of these 10 comments, one severe issue, everything else is I can navigate it. Makes for a much better experience. Kai, thank you very much for the link to the VS Code for creating patches. There's a couple of links I'll add to the bottom of the slide for creating patch files. Um, there's the one from the VS Code. There's also one from Ruby Mine and Jeff Rains. Um, but even create, even getting comfortable creating them locally is a great skill to have. Super stuff. I don't think we have any other questions. Does anybody else? Oh, here we go. Austin, when working with non-engineers, what are some things you've run into that helped or hindered the review process? That's a really good question. Yannick, do you want to, you want to take that one? I'll give it a go. Um, I'd say actually all of the, all of the above. Like um, definitely when reviewing things from non-engineers, they might be not so familiar with the yeah with our practices and with the techniques we are using. So be super super um, cautious and go slow and yeah communicate in a precise way. Adding demos, um, maybe when adding a Git patch, um, try to drop in a little tutorial link on how to work with those because this can be overwhelming. But other than that, how do you feel about it, Dave? Um, so I'm going to give a miniature shout out to both Amelia and Sarah from the monitor stage. Well, Sarah was former monitor, my PM when I worked there. Um, they taught me an awful lot about properly interacting with PM and UX on merge requests. And the big things that I think were really fantastic as part of the merge review was getting PM and UX in earlier rather than later to reduce wasted feedback time and make sure you're going in the right direction. This really holds especially true for UX. You want to make sure that what you're doing is actually the polished product that's going to go into the production code base. With PMs, offering a very succinct how-to test guide, because not everybody is super technical, as you've mentioned. 
So it's really on me as an author to offer up an easy way to get in and suggest the changes that we've made and to make the code review process much, much smoother. But I would also, on the other hand, encourage both UX and PMs to lean in to getting involved in the code review process. It doesn't have to be just engineering. Absolutely. Sweet. Let's see if there are any more questions in the chat. No, I think that might be everybody, is it? No, no worries. Yes, yeah, thank you, Austin. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for attending. It was a fantastic session. Hopefully, you come away with this with some tools in your tool belt for better code reviews. And me and Yannick's next goal is to actually get that code merged to production. So wish us well. <laughs> <laughs> gonna do our very best yeah uh, from my side as well thanks everybody for taking the time and have a great contribution see you soon enjoy it <laughs>